if a revival is to break out, it starts with one. One person has to feel that, then another person, then another, so on and so forth. For that to come both to our lives and to our church. Oftentimes we read the gospel, and if we're not careful, we'll read the gospel from a very collective mindset. We read it thinking, how's this apply to the church? And really we should be reading it, how does it apply to me? What's going to change in my life because of the influence that God has made? I yesterday got to speak to the pastors of the state of West Virginia that were gathered at a meeting that I was at, and I talked to them about us tending to be on the wrong side of the Red Sea. And we're standing on the side yelling at Moses, well, did you just bring us out here because there's no graves in Egypt? There's, it would have been better off for us to stay there. We told you that. And then the Red Sea parts. And they see God's pathway for them. But even then, I, I don't... I mean, you can think what you want to, but when you read it and you see the issues that Israel was dealing with at the time... I, I don't think if it hadn't have been for Egypt coming up behind them, they wouldn't have entered the Red Sea. They would have just stood there, looking at this marvel, understanding not what to do. But it took someone to take a step, and then they started to walk and to go. And My granddad used to always tell me that a walk of a thousand steps starts with one. I'm sure you've heard something similar to that in your life as well, and for us as a church, if we want to move forward into the future, it's going to take some of us being those ones, those people that will step out and will go and reintroduce ourselves and our Lord to the community around us. Why this title? Well, every great feat that we see in the Bible, God chose most often to start with one person. Starts with Adam, then Noah, then Abraham. Then goes to Isaac, to Joseph, to Moses, to Joshua, to David, and then of course to Jesus. Even the first confession of who Jesus was comes from one, Simon Peter, who replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Then Thomas later says a very similar thing, and my Lord and my God. Even on the day of Pentecost, even though we know other speakers, other people heard Speaking in their language, it's Peter who stands up and delivers the message. Because that journey of a thousand steps begins with one, one person. And I would encourage you that today as you listen to the message and as you pray uh, through uh, devotionals that you may have, or if you have reading plans you're using to read the scriptures this year, that as you read them, Read them with an eye for, if I'm the one Lord, what step do I need to take? Ultimately, it will only impact you when the Word of God begins to apply to you. What it applies to me. The verses that we're going to focus on today are in 1 Peter. I'm going to pray for us and then we will read them and go through the remainder of our message this morning. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we come to you in a, in a time, in a place, in a context that's changing around us. Uh, Lord, we see uh, the world and the way it is going away from you. <clears throat> we wonder sometimes, Lord, what part we can play in turning that around, or if there's any way at times to turn it around. But Lord, I'm encouraged that if just one person will commit themselves to following you, to taking the Word of God and applying it to their lives, Lord, they will impact other people all around them. We know your Word doesn't return void, and today, Lord, I pray that it doesn't that the hearts and minds of those in this room, that my heart and mind are convicted by the words that you give us, the words that you've left for us in the Bible, and that, Lord, we begin to make our walk match our talk. Maybe 
in that exhibit before the world, they would begin to see the valid and validity and worth of our God. If he can't change, if you can't change us, Lord, they'll never believe you can change them. Help us, Lord, to be the one that will choose today to step out in your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Verses are 1 Peter 3, 15. Really, this is the focal verse of the whole message. But in your hearts, honor Christ. The Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. There's so many aspects of these words that could hit home for us, holding in our hearts Christ as holy, honoring Him in the way we live our lives, being prepared to make a defense for the hope that is within us, and making sure that we do that in a way that shows gentleness and respect and not being brash or hurtful. Although I will say that when it comes to that, be prepared when you begin to tell people the truth. It's going to hurt them. But don't make it because of your delivery. Anytime we're confronted with our sins, it can be hurtful, painful, hard to hear, hard to bear. 1 Peter 3, 1. 3, 1, 3 through 5 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. We have a hope that the lost world does not. They don't possess the same hope that we do. I hope that by this point in our lives, and particularly for those of us that have been in church for any period of time at all, we, we see the, the things that they put out every year, statistics that say somewhere between 70 and 80% of Americans are Christians. We also see the ones that say one in four professing Christians attends church at least once a month. Somewhere along the line, the hope that is within us, even in some that profess Christ as their Lord, is missing. And the world around us is a world filled with all kinds of false hopes, but no real hope. If we're going to deliver this message of hope to them, it must first be existent in us. Do you have hope in the Lord? Do you believe that better things are ahead than we're behind? Do you believe He will fill up and fulfill His promises to us? If we do, we have a hope that the world does not have. But is hope what they see? Is hope what they encounter when they run into a Christian? Even if they knew not how to describe it, there's supposed to be a difference, some palpable way to recognize this person is not like the last person I met. We have a hope that the lost world does not have. 1 Peter 1.13 says, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We know Christ is returning. And because we know He is returning, we have hope. And we're to set our minds 
on that fact. We're supposed to be prepared for action, assuming that at some point when our Lord comes back, something is going to occur. We're supposed to be sober-minded about it, which means we're not confused. We're not disoriented by the world that's around us, by all the challenges that we face. Remember, we have a hope that the lost world does not have. So when the lost world is into confusion and all kinds of of lostness and and just a, a, a genuine lack of hope, we should look different than that. We shouldn't follow them. We should follow our Lord. Prepare for action. Be sober-minded. Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Romans 15, 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Psalms 121, 1 and 2 says, I lift up my eyes to the hills, for where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. It means when the world is falling apart around us, we don't lose hope, because our Lord is not influenced by the world. He has overcome the world. We should be the most hopeful people on the planet. We have God on our side. We are children of God. We have this promise of the imperishable and the eternal. Romans 8, 34, 8, 34 through 37 says, Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. But no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. We have a hope that the world does not have. When they are crushed by the things around them, we are not crushed by those things. When we are hard-pressed on all sides, we are not overcome. Nothing can take our hope from us. If God is for us, who can be against us? We have a hope that the lost world does not have. Our focus verse said, but in your hearts, honor Christ, the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense for anyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Peter is encouraging believers to pursue righteousness and that no matter what or who comes against you, remember the hope that you have and stand firm. Remember your hope. It is really the only way we will not find ourselves going the way of the world. That we won't find ourselves caught up in the fear or the hate of the world. That we won't be moved by the pressures of the world. We do not have a spirit of fear. That's why we need to prepare to give a defense. The word here is actually apologia, which really just means to give an answer or speech in defense of oneself or beliefs. It is where we get the word today for apologetics. If you've ever taken an apologetics class, it just simply means a defense of the faith to learn how to better defend it. You don't need an apologetics class to do that in most instances. Most instances, all you need to know is the hope you have in the Lord. You know, it's funny because misery loves company, right? We, we all know that. Uh, if somebody's miserable, they would love nothing more than to help you be miserable as well. 
Uh, I wish that only existed in the world. It tends to exist even in the inside walls of the church where you know, I'm upset about something and I'm going to try really hard to get others upset about that same thing. Misery loves company. But I would encourage you that hope is also contagious. If you are a hopeful person who is, who is uh, upbeat, encouraged, uh, blessed, feeling thankful and grateful, those things are contagious too and you will find others around you feeling those same things. We tend to always have an option. You know, do we go the way of the misery is contagious kind of a misery loves company side or do we lean towards hope? And for me, that's always been the decision when it comes to Christ. When you look, you know, you look out at the Bible, you hear a sermon, you sit in a Sunday school class, you go to VBS, wherever it is, and somewhere along the line, there comes a choice for you. Will you follow me? That's what Jesus is saying to us. Will you follow me? And the way he goes has hope. The way he goes has promise. The way he goes costs us something, but his burden is easy. His yoke is light. Which do we choose? If you were to think back over the last year in time, which one would people characterize your life as being? Hopeful or hopeless? Because you can't defend the hope that is within you when there's no hope in you. Choose to follow Christ and not the lost world around us. You know, it only takes one, though. One person coming out and being sincere and confirmed in their faith, and people recognize it. I've told that story before with myself and my wife, but I could tell you other stories as well, but one of the main ones was the person that was probably my best friend growing up, who the first time we were ever at their house after I got saved said, you're welcome here as long as you don't try to shove Jesus down our throat. Uh, he really didn't have any interest in it. Neither did his wife. Thirteen years later, they come forward in church service, surrender their lives to Christ, and his words were, whatever you've had for the last 13 years, I want. Because people watch and pay attention. As a lost person, as a lost adult, I was watching. I didn't want to be hopeless. I didn't want to be lost. I just couldn't find anybody that wasn't. I didn't see the hope. You could be somebody's one. Where they see hope, they see promise, they see grace. It's funny how small of a thing that happen that way. It's not certainly not just faith that starts with one person. Oftentimes when it comes to the end of service, when we're praying up front, you know, people don't want to move for one reason or another. They don't want to come forward and pray. Maybe somebody will think something's wrong with you or you have some sin you need to confess or something else. They don't want to come forward and pray. And it usually takes one or two people to come forward to make people feel comfortable to come forward and make that decision. Sometimes when we're singing a song and we raise our hands or something else, we won't do that until someone else does it. If you've been around someone who is truly hopeful, it's hard not to be hopeful. And we as a church have an opportunity every day, every week, to portray the hope that is within us and then be prepared to defend the hope that is within us. Romans 12, 12 says, Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant 
in prayer. My story's been hashed and rehashed like I told you before. I say all this to tell you that there is a lost world out there full of lost people that are not that much different than who I was before I met Christ that are waiting to meet you. Full of hope in Christ. They're waiting to see that something else is real and available to them. They already know how bad the world is. They already know how miserable life can be. They don't need you to defend your misery. They need you to defend your hope. I remember uh, I hadn't been saved very long. I think it was around 2006 or 2007. And that hope being contagious, I, I got to see in kind of a real physical way. And there's a song by Russell Taft that uh, is basically just, it basically says we will stand. But the main chorus of it says, together we will work until he comes. And it's talking about brother, you're my brother, you're my sister, so take me by the hand. Together we will work until he comes. There's no foe that can defeat us when we're walking side by side. As long as there is love, we will stand. And the whole point of the song is, is that together we can do anything. Together in Christ, we can do anything. As brothers and sisters in Christ. But sitting there that day, I remember thinking, we need to do something. I mean, I felt like there needed to be some response to this Song. We were in a place where we had lost all three of our pastors in three months or four months. We had no pastors. We were in a church that should have held 500, and there was 95 of us trying to figure out how in the world is this church going to survive? How's it going to move forward? And we're singing this song. So I got up and my wife got up, we walked over, and grabbed the hands of some people in the pews beside us. They stood up and grabbed people's hands beside them, and people beside them, and before you knew it, there were people holding their, each other's hands all the way across that sanctuary singing this song. But it took one. Someone had to make the move. Someone had to decide to step out. Someone had to be willing to defend the hope that was within them. As revival always starts with one. Find your joy, find your hope in the Lord, and others will find it as well. The staff verse for this year has been this one. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. I pray there's one today who might echo that cry with us. That it, he would create in us a clean heart. That he would renew a right spirit within us. And that the hope that we're to have in the Lord would become visible to the world around us. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. So we need to take each other by the hand. We need to work until he comes. We need to find our hope in him. And when we do, we will stand. And it only takes one to decide to start that. And today I hope you will be that one.